And uh, so we're going to get into the message right now. So grab your neighbor's hand, if you would, and we're going to pray. Father, we thank you today, Lord, for your goodness and your grace. And Lord, we just pray that right now, Lord, that you would open up our hearts and our minds to the truth. And Lord, that you would reveal to us, Lord, your perfect will, Father. And Lord, we know that by your power, all things are possible. And so, Father, we are praying right now that you would save everyone in this service that doesn't know you and that you would re re rebuild and revive and set free, Lord, all of those that are your people. And we thank you for this, Lord, in Jesus' mighty name. Amen and amen. All right, turn to your neighbor right now and say, I think you are all right. Cool dude. All right. Praise the Lord Jesus. Well, good morning, everybody. Are you hungry for the word today? All right, good. Open up your Bibles, if you would, over the book of Revelation, chapter 20. And uh, today I want to talk about being accountable before God. Amen? Accountability. Praise God. Now, in my life, I want to, you know, when I eventually face God in the life to come, I want to make sure that when I'm there that I don't have regrets that I didn't do all that I should do or all that I could have done in that moment. Amen. And I know that in order to do that, I'm going to have to display a certain level of faithfulness. And so today as we look at these truths, the idea is to produce within you the fruit of faithfulness in your life. And just to give you a little bit of a nugget of how we do this, because in reality, none of us are faithful except Jesus. Amen? Amen. But I can be faithful with his help. It was like the other day I was uh, at home and uh, it was in the afternoon and it was late and I told my wife, I said, I'd like to go down and shoot some balls, golf balls at the driving range. She said, well, I don't want to go, but she said, when you come back, give me a Slurpee at 7-Eleven. And uh, she had a sore throat. And so I said, uh, all right, sure. So I went outside and I said, Lord, uh, uh, could you remind me to get her the Slurpee <laughs> after we get done driving the balls? So we went down there and we drove the balls. And then afterwards, the Lord said to me, he said, don't forget the Slurpee. See, the point is, is that I'm only so faithful within myself. But when God is your source and your guide and the one that you can trust in, you can be faithful all the time in your life. Amen? And so, but let's lay a foundation today. I'm going to talk about several different forms of judgment in the Bible that hold people accountable. And one of them is called the great white throne judgment. And one of the mistakes that we often make interpreting Scripture is that we take verses and we apply it to believers when the verse itself was given to us to tell unbelievers, basically. It's not really a verse that applies to us. And sometimes we do that with verses on judgment. We see any place in the Bible that says judgment, we think that's for us. But... There's a judgment for the believer, and there's also a judgment for the unbeliever. Amen. So let's look at the unbeliever first, all right? So turn with me to Revelation 20, and uh, look with me in verse <clears throat> 11, and notice what it says. Then I saw a great white throne, and him who sat on it from, from those face the earth, and the earth fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God. And the books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged according to their works by the things which were written in the books. And the sea gave up the dead who were, were in it. Death and Hades delivered up the dead who were in them. And they were judged, each one according to his works. Then death... And Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And anyone not found written in the book of life 
was cast into the lake of fire. So when it mentions here the dead, he's referring to those who died without Jesus. Amen. And in it tells us that people will stand before God and books will be opened. And in those books are the things that you did in your life, whether good or bad, and those things will be evaluated. But it says that everyone there, no matter what they did that was good, no matter what they did that was bad, if their name was not found written in the Lamb's book of life, they were cast in the lake of fire. Are you hearing me? So it brings me to a question. If what sin is it that people are cast into the lake of fire over. What sin is it? Is it adultery? Is it stealing? Is it lying? What is it? What sin is it that casts people into sin? Here's what what a lot of people don't understand. It's not one sin. It's rejecting Jesus. Amen? Now, it didn't matter how many good deeds they did or how many bad deeds they did, the issue was if their name was not found in the Lamb's book of life, they didn't go to heaven. Because, gee, see, what God did is he said, all right, man has sinned, man has fallen, and the only way they can be restored is if I send my son into this world and he goes on to the cross and all of their sins I'll put in his body and I'll punish Jesus for all of their sins and so then if they believe on him, they'll be saved. And, and so I want you to see this, that people don't go to hell because they're homosexuals. They don't go to hell because they're adulterers. They don't go to hell because they lie or they steal. They go to hell because they reject the avenue in which God provided salvation for them. Are you hearing me? It's like a, a, a raging river. And on that river, you're in the river, and you're going down the river, and there is a fall coming up. And you know that once you go over the fall, you're going to perish. And there's one fireman on the side of the, side of the river with a rope. And he says, catch this rope. This is the only way you're going to get saved. He says, listen, the helicopter won't be here in time. The boat won't be here in time. The only way you can be saved is by this rope. Well, Jesus said that I am the way, the truth, and the life. He didn't say that I am one of the ways. He said, I am the way. Amen? So the, so it's up to the church that we would share that with everybody in the world. Because the Bible teaches us that The world lies in deception. They're all deceived by the devil. And they don't realize the only way that they're going to get saved is not by moral change. They're going to get saved by a Savior that they believe in. And once they get saved by him, then their lives change. But you can't be saved by good works. You can't be saved by being really good. Because no one can be good enough to be in God's presence. No one is is pure enough to be in his presence, but Jesus is. So that's the first judgment I wanted to get across to you that's important. And remember this, that at the time that this was written or spoken of, should I say, was a time when the day of salvation had ended. In other words, when the judgment, when this judgment occurs, the time to get saved is over. It's too late. Into the road. Paul said it like this in Corinthians. He said that today is the day of salvation. Now is that day. Now is that moment. So now is the time to receive this avenue of salvation. It won't always be here. It's coming a time when no one will be able to be saved that isn't saved. Amen? All right. So, so the sins in our lives are not what put us in heaven directly. It's rejecting Jesus that does it. That does it. Now, if you're a believer here today, and most of you are, 
you have already believed on Christ and all your sins have been put on Jesus on the cross. And when he was punished for your sins, you were granted salvation through his righteousness. It's powerful. It's awesome. But now turn with me over to Hebrews chapter 9, please. Hebrews chapter 9. And take a look at this in this particular verse here. Hebrews 9 verse 28. And take a look what it says. It says this, so Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many to those who eagerly wait for him. He will appear the second time. Now watch this. Apart from sin. Say it with me. Apart from sin for salvation. Now, why does it say that? For this reason. When the Lord comes back and we stand before him at the judgment seat of Christ, we will not be judged for our sins because our sins were judged on the cross. Did you hear me? All of my sins, past, present, future, all the ones that I will commit that I haven't committed, all of those were judged on Jesus on the cross. So when Jesus returns the second time for me and I got to stand before him and give an account of my life, I will not be judged for my sins because Jesus was already judged for them in my life. Come on! That's it? That's powerful. That God would judge Jesus for our sins. And so all I got to do now is look forward to standing before the Lord. And I'm going to stand in the judgment seat of Christ. I want to explain that to you. Turn with me to Hebrew or Romans 14, please. Romans 14. And take a look in verse 10. But why do you judge your brother or why do you show contempt for your brother, for we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. For it is written, as I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me and every tongue shall confess to God, so that each of us shall give an account of himself to God. Talking about believers, right? Now turn over with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. And let me show you another verse on the same issue. All right, 1 Corinthians 4, verse 5 says this. Therefore, judge nothing before the time until the Lord comes, who will bring to, bring to light the hidden things of darkness and reveal the counsel of the hearts. Then each one's praise will come from God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I said, hallelujah. Now, I got it. See, we may walk hand in hand with God, but God has his hand on us in case we stumble. I got you. I got you. And even with my grandkids, sometimes they try to escape, and they, and they don't want to hold hands with me, and I just grab them, throw them on my shoulder, and go, all right. So it says like that with God. He, he just says, I mean, you know, once you receive eternal life, I'm not going to let you go. Hallelujah. No, I'm not going to let you go. You, you may stumble and think you're not saved, but I'm still there. You, you, may, you may go the wrong way, but I'm still there. You may not be able to help yourself, but I'm there. And he holds you because he, he won't let you be tempted beyond what you can take. We'll always provide a way of escape for you. Come on, church. Wow, that's good preaching. So, so I can be in that mindset that, Lord, I'm accountable to what you've given me in my life. But, Lord, it's because you are with me. And you can help me. Even when I'm full of unbelief, you're still there. Paul said it this way. He says, when you're faithless, he is faithful and will not deny himself. 
Well, he's talking about you in him. In him, he won't deny you. Wow. That's good stuff. It's good stuff. Now, turn with me over to Matthew chapter, uh, or Luke 16, please. Luke 16, and get ready to be exceptionally blessed right now. Come on, church. Get ready to be blessed. Are you ready? Look at this. Look at what Jesus says about faithfulness in verse 10. He says this. He who is faithful in what is least is faithful also in much. He who is unjust in what is least is unjust also in much. Therefore, if you have not been faithful in unrighteous mammon, who will commit to you true tr- or tr- uh, trust the true riches? And if you have not been faithful in what is another man's, who will give you? What is your own? Now, look what he's saying here, church. See, faithfulness is doing what's right when it's easy, when it's hard, when it's impossible, when it's beyond your resources. That's what faithfulness is. And here's what he says. He says, People, they, they, they go, well, I'll be faithful once I get my resources bigger. Once I have more of an ability, I will. And he says, no, it doesn't work that way. If you're not faithful with little, you won't be faithful with much. Amen. So watch, if I can't tithe when I'm making $20,000 a year, how am I going to tithe when I'm making $300,000 a year? You can't do it, can you? And then he says this, he says, If you can't be faithful with another man's stuff, he's talking about stewardship there. Stewardship. How do you expect to get your own stuff? And we all know we're stewards, right? That's why we're held accountable. All the stories we've been reading here about stewards, people that are held accountable because they're handling somebody else's stuff. So I said this last week, and it's true, that when you tithe, You're a steward over God's stuff. The Bible said that the earth and the fullness of the earth belongs to God. So we get saved. Everything that we have, our job, everything comes from God. None of it is ours. None of us, we created it. It's all God's. And so we come into this world and and then we produce fruit and God calls us stewards. But he requires of his steward that they would take 10% of the increase they have and deposit it into the work of the ministry, the great commission, the church, so that it can expand. Amen? And then he says, if you do that, all the other increase is yours. So, so he's given you the, his stuff to give you increase. Amen. Think about it. It's powerful. And people, they go, well, is tithing really about increase? Yeah, it is. It really is. Think about it from this standpoint. It'll help you. In the Bible, we see two predominant promises about the tithe. Malachi 3 says that you bring in all the tithe, that I'm going to open up the windows of heaven upon you, and Pour a blessing on your life that you don't have room enough to contain. So if you got a, a farm that has two barns, build two more barns. You got a farm that has one barn, build another barn. In other words, I'm going to give you such an increase that you need to start seeing yourself handling more than what you have now. That's a promise, isn't it? Amen? And then he says he'll rebuke the devourer as well. That's in Malachi. But remember, in Malachi, it was during an economic downturn. Economy was bad, stock market was down, inflation was up, wages were down, it was bad. And so when he tells them to obey him in that time, he raises the bar of what we should expect. But in Proverbs, at the golden age of Israel, when Solomon was, was leading Israel, 
prosperity everywhere. He says, honor the Lord with your tithes and your first fruits. And it says, your bonds will be filled with plenty and your vats will overflow with wine. In other words, I'm going to give you more than enough for what you already got. But it's a lower level, isn't it? Here's what I want you to see. The harder it is to do what is right, the higher the prize. Amen. The easier it is to do the word, the lesser the prize. It's always a prize, but it's less. So when you're faithful, wow, I am faithful. Wow, in the hard times as well as the good times. And, 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 it's, and people, they go, well, pastor, you know, you're tithing, you know, I don't know about that kind of stuff. Listen to me. Tithing is the only way that I know in Scripture that God can bless you with more than enough. And he'll know it won't all be spent on yourself. Because when you're a tither, you get a job increase, the church gets an increase. Isn't that right? You, get, you, you go from 100000 a year to 300000 the church gets it too. So he has no reservations about blessing you with more than enough. Because of that, you know, and we look at people like Abraham, who was very rich, and we forget a few things about him. Number one, when he left Ur of the Chaldees, he left everything that he had to follow God. And Jesus said that those that leave their mothers and lands and sisters and brothers for my sake shall receive a hundred times more in this lifetime with persecution in the life to come eternal life. So he was blessed because he gave it all. And so when he tithed later, that was way below. I'm okay. That's way below what he started with. I mean, think about it for a minute. Jesus gave his life for us. What if you were the rich young ruler and Jesus said, hey, follow me, but first sell out everything in the stock market you own. Sell all your businesses. Give to the poor and then come follow. What if he'd said that to you? That'd be the difference between being saved or lost, wouldn't it? Huh? But but he doesn't do that to everybody. He doesn't. And if he does, it'll be worth your while. So, God wants the church to increase. As you increase. And the only way that you can really, really handle large amounts of money is if you've established tither in the church. And you do it when you were broke, and you do it when you had much and you do it there, and God blesses you. Well, because we're all going to be held accountable. Amen. Think about it. Judgment seat of Christ. We're all there. And he says, wait a minute. I want to break this off from an individual, you know, word to a corporate word of the people of the river. I want to talk to you for a minute. Do you know what you could have done if all of you had obeyed me. And then he shows us thousands upon thousands of people accepting Christ. Are you hearing what I'm saying here? I'm not the only one that has to obey. The whole church needs to. Amen. Amen. On behalf of Jack and Joyce, we want to say thank you for supporting our ministry. When in the Seattle area, we invite you to join us for services at the River, Sundays at 9 a.m., 11 a.m., and 6 p.m., and Wednesdays at 7 p.m. Thanks again for watching, and join us next week at the River.